This is Untangled, fly fishing for everyone. Presented by Ventures Fly Company. So last week, I'm out on the water. I'm getting into some fish. There's blue wings hatching. It really doesn't get much better than that, especially uh, it was still February that week. So especially in February, it doesn't get much better than that. And I remember I got off the water and it was like, you know, 38, 39 degrees outside. It wasn't quite 40. It was warm though. And I got off. I remember looking around and thinking like, man, I think winter might finally be done with me. I think we might be on the upside of all this wonderful weather we've been having lately. And boy, was I wrong. Because as I'm sure most folks cross country can't attest right now, winter ain't exactly done with us, is it? (laughs) Oh, yeah. It's snowing today again here in Wyoming. And I thought that I was out of the worst of the weather, but apparently I wasn't. So I think we're all going to be in for a long winter, but we need the moisture, especially out here in the West. So not complaining. I'm just, I just wanted to warm up to like mid thirties so that I'm not freezing to death when I'm out there on the water. That, that's all I'm really asking at this point. Oh, but anyways, thanks to everybody for joining us for another episode of Untangled. Uh, that is the show, and I am Spencer Durant, your host. Uh, we've got a great little show lined up for you today. It's our 13th episode. We're going to dive into fly reels. You're getting a crash course on fly reels today, so you're really going to know what you need to know about reels. <laughs> see, see what I did there? Yeah, I know. That was bad. Uh, we're also going to talk about how to keep your dry dropper rigs untangled. And reel and line recommendations for Euro nymphing rods. So we got a lot of fun stuff lined up here. You don't want to go anywhere for this show. So definitely set in, turn off your notifications, and just bask in the knowledge that's about to be dumped on you right now. Okay. Uh, don't forget episode 16 coming up in three more episodes. The whole Ventures crew is going to be together. We're going to be answering questions. We're going to be talking shop and We've got some fantastic new product we're going to be talking about on episode 16. So you don't want to miss that one coming up in three episodes from now. All right, let's go ahead and jump right into the first question today. Uh, Andrew from Colorado asks, can you give us a crash course on fly reels? Particularly, how can you adjust the drag to help make you a better angler? Well. I wasn't aware that the drag alone on a fly reel could make you a better angler. Uh, It's an interesting way to ask that question. Uh, I've never really heard it worded quite that way before. I think, kidding aside, Andrew, I think what you're probably trying to get at is how can you use the drag to help you land fish quickly and safely and more effectively so that you're not losing fish, you're not wearing them out too much. So that's a tack that I'm going to take with my answer here for you today. All right. A fly reel is really designed to do two things. Hold your fly line and provide resistance when a trout or any other fishy critter that you care to catch pulls line off of the reel's spool. Uh, Really, fly line, fly reels are just really fancy, pretty looking reel holders like 90% of the time. Line holders, not reel holders. A reel is a line holder most of the time. So I I always find it kind of funny that folks get so amped on trout reels. Like it makes a lot of sense to me to get amped on a trout reel or on a fly reel for steelhead or anything saltwater fishing or carp fishing. But when you're looking at just like a little trout reel and you're just, you know, looking at the majority of trout fishing, you don't really need that much of a drag to begin with. Now I know somebody's going to say, well, if you catch all the big fish like I do, you definitely need the drag. Okay. Well, If you are cranking your drag down on every trout that you catch, please call me. I would love to come fishing with you in a place like that. (laughs) All right. Because even here in Wyoming, we've got pretty, you know, above average trout numbers and I'm not putting most of those trout on the reel. All right. So I guess that's kind of the first thing to think about is take like all this with a grain of salt too, Andrew, that a reel is important. Yes. It's a very important piece of equipment, but you're not going to use it all the time. Most of the time, it's just there to hold your fly line and look pretty. 
or Instagram pictures. That's the whole reason that we get these fancy colors of reels anymore, right? Uh, but that 10% of the time, though, when the reel uh, needs to work, that's when you want a really good reel. I think that's the first time that I made that one to a really good reel. Uh, <laughs> anyways, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I will stop. Okay. Uh, anyways, that's what fly reels are really designed to do. Okay. Uh, the resistance that that fly reel provides to your line when a uh, fish takes line from you, uh, that's what we commonly refer to as drag. So tightening the reel's drag is going to increase how much force it requires a fish to use to pull line off of the reel and consequently to get away from you. All right. There are two tri- uh I'm having a I'm having a rough one today, folks. I apologize. Uh, there are two types of drag systems here. Okay, a click pull or a disc drag. A click and pull drag is usually preset. It can't be adjusted very much, and it's a very simple. Uh, it's a very simple piece of machinery. Really, really easy to understand. It's. And this is a very simplified version, but it's usually just a simple gear or the pawl that is pressing against some metal inside the reel that provides resistance as the spool moves around the reel spindle. That's how a click pawl reel is going to give you resistance, but it's usually preset. You can't like adjust the tension on that with a lot of uh, click pawl reels. There are some that you can do that, but most of them, it's kind of a preset uh, amount of tension. So a disc drag works a lot differently. It uses a set of washers that creates friction against the spool, and the tension on those washers can often be adjusted from a very low setting, so minimal drag to a very high setting, like a ton of drag. Now, as far as actually using drag to help you land fish, like everything in fly fishing, that is largely going to depend on your situation. But I will go over some examples here that should help explain things, hopefully clear it up a little bit with when we're going to use uh, when we're going to use the reels. All right. So for the majority of trout fishing, like I've already said, you do not need your drag. Uh, all the drag really does is help you control the fish so that you can get it to the net quicker. An example, I was out on the Niagara River uh, in upstate New York a couple weeks ago and catching a lake trout and Great Lakes steelhead. A ton of fun, by the way. If you've never been up uh, into that part of the country to fish, highly recommend it. That is a, it's just a lot of fun up there. Really different fishing than what I'm used to out here in the Rockies. Uh, but I hooked a really big lake trout, probably about a 10-pound lake trout, uh, in the Niagara River. And it starts taking line. And we were in a calmer bit of water. And this lake trout just hits the, hits the line and just starts just horsing me uh, into the current. It's trying to get into the current. And the Niagara River is this is big water, <laughs> right, folks? This is not just like, oh, I'm going to go down to the North Platte today. No, this is hundreds of thousands of cubic feet per second water, all right? Way different than anything that I'm actually used to out here in the West. So I could not let that fish get out into the current or it was going to be goodbye fish, right? So I cranked the drag down and because the fish was able to take less line with that drag tightened down, I was able to horse the fish back into calmer water and get it back into the net. That is kind of your, your like picture perfect scenario for when you're using drag. You've got a pretty decent fish on the line. It's trying to get away. There's current or there's something that can wrap the line around and break it off. You crank the drag down. The fish can't move. All of a sudden you're able to go up there, net the fish. Boom. Everybody's happy. Fish goes back. You get your Instagram picture. It's perfect. That's kind of your picture perfect scenario for how you want to utilize drag. Uh, but that's also kind of an extreme example, too. You're usually, uh, it's rare with trout fishing to be horsing 10 pound trout very often. So, with that said, I usually have my trout reel set at like a very medium drag setting and I adjust based on how big the fish feels. You don't always see them right off the bat, so you just have to go off of feel. If it starts ripping off line, then yep, I'm going to crank that drag down. I'm going to slow the fish down. I'm going to get that fish back under control. Most of the time, though, like I've said, you're going to be hard-pressed to run into fish that really touch your drag, especially on our modern reels. Our reels these days 
are fantastic. All right, they're freaking fantastic. Actually, they are so good at stopping fish in their tracks. It makes me feel kind of bad for all the old fly fishers who had to wrangle fish without these things. Like I look at what my grandpa used uh, to fly fish with and some of the fish that he's got on his wall. And I'm like in awe, right? But again, even with fish that big that I see on that wall, he wasn't using fancy dish track reels. He had click paw reels. So it's entirely possible to land fish without a fancy drag. It, it's a lot of it's in the technique, but your question, Andrew, was about the drag. So that's what we're, we're going over here. Uh, the last thing I want to touch on, though, is you don't want to adjust your drag so tight that the fish can't even move the line. That's when you're going to start breaking, uh, breaking your leader and your tippet, especially if you use like a lot of 5X tippet. You're going to snap those fish off super quick if your drag's too tight. So keep that drag at like a nice medium to medium light setting and only start to crank it down if you feel like the fish is getting away from you and you can't control it. So hopefully that's a good overview of reels and drag and how we can use them to uh, more effectively get, uh, get fish under control and put them in the net. So thank you, Andrew. That was a great, great question. How would you like to unlock the deepest, darkest mysteries of fly fishing? How would you like to know everything there is to know about this sport? How would you like to become a fly fishing master, a legend, nay, a guru? <laughs> I'd love that too. And unfortunately, I don't think we're going to be able to get you to guru status here because what even is a guru in the first place, right? But we can certainly answer questions that you have about fly fishing. That's the whole point of Untangled. So if you've got a question that you really need to know the answer to, or you're just looking to up your skills a little bit in the fly fishing game, do not hesitate to get in touch with us at Untangled. Click the link in the podcast description to submit a question to us. Get it answered here. And who knows? Maybe that answer will be the one that propels you to guru status. Moving on in the show, this question actually comes to us from a comment on a recent YouTube video. So I don't have your name or where you're from, but I've got your YouTube handle. So how do you stop tangles with a dry dropper 334 outdoors? Asked that question on a recent YouTube video. So thank you, though, for bringing this topic up. It's a great topic and <laughs> reminds me, I, I love to fish a three fly rig when I can. So a dry dropper dropper. And I had a group of buddies that I fished with a lot about 10 years ago. And they, I was always fishing three flies and they thought it was dumb because I was always tangled all the time, but they kept calling me old triple threat. They're like, Oh, triple threats here today. <laughs> and, uh, it was a lot of fun. I liked, I liked that nickname. I don't know where it went. We kind of all, a couple guys got married, you know, jobs, you know, a whole thing, reasons why you don't fish as much together as you used to. Uh, those are some good times being, being all triple threat. So if, uh, Clark or Drew or, uh, or Jesse is listening, uh, yeah, I still remember the triple threat days guys. <laughs> oh, so I'm going to start off to answer this question by referencing a quote from Dom Swintoski, the guy behind trout bitten, uh, like usual, the full article is going to be linked in the podcast description, but Dom is, if you're not uh, familiar with Dom and his great stuff, do yourself a favor and go check it out because Dom is fantastic. He's one of the good guys. So this is what Dom says about casting tandem rigs. He says, the shorter distance between flies equals more tangles. I like my flies at least 16 inches apart, usually 18 to 24. Any closer than that, and I just accept that the flies will tangle more. Generally, lengthening the distance between flies results in fewer tangles. However, the opposite can be true with a dry dropper. If the dropper nymph is too light and the tippet is thin, the nymph often lags behind. It never turns over to pass the wind-resistant dry fly, resulting in two flies and a bunch of tippet landing in the same place. Tangle City. So, there is a lot to unpack there. A lot of great stuff. The things that I want to kind of pull out of that focus on for us is going to be the length between droppers and your tippet size. Because as we know in fly fishing, 
size is everything. <laughs> Am I right? So uh, I often find, especially among newer anglers, that we use too thin of tippet on a very regular basis. It's awesome to say that you landed a fish on 8X, and yes, 8X exists. I even have some 9X tippet kicking around here somewhere. Uh, but it, really, it, it, you don't need it. It's cool. It's a novelty item. It, it's like uh, it's like all the different ladles that you get when you get married, right? You get like a stack of these utensils, and we got my wife and I. We got like a dozen different ladles, and we use the same two the whole time. The rest of them just sit there looking cool. Okay, that's what like eight X tippet is doing for you. Okay. Yeah, you, you you might bring it out when Aunt Dorothy comes over to visit, and that's about it. Okay, and I don't know why Aunt Dorothy's interested in 8X Tippet, but hopefully you get the drift that I'm laying down there. Uh, <laughs> the point here is uh, 6 and 7X Tippets are really light tippets. They do have their place, but it's almost rarely. In fact, I would even go so far as to say this is one of the few things that never has a place in a dry dropper rig. I am almost always fishing four or five X tippet and a couple of the best guides I know. And these are guides who have been guiding for decades now. Uh, they only use straight sections of like six to eight pound fluorocarbon uh, to rig up their dry droppers. So first step, if you're experiencing a lot of tangles with your dry dropper rigs is to use four or five X tippet uh, really just up the size of the line, it's going to get tangled a lot less. The second step is to add that extra length that uh, Dom talked about. And I'm in full agreement with Dom that you need at least 18 to 24 inches between a dry fly and your dropper. Anything less than that is always going to result in a lot of tangles. And probably if your dropper is only like 16 inches long, it's probably not getting down deep enough to be effective anyways, unless you're on really shallow water or the fish are really high in the water column, right? I think the only time that I fish a really, really short dry dropper rig is going to be a dry fly and then either a lightly weighted or a completely unweighted emerger or nymph made to be fished in like the very top of the water column. Uh, but other than that, a traditional dry dropper rig like we think with a dry fly and a nymph, it needs to be down deeper than that. So uh, Dom gives a ton of other great tips in this article that it's, it's definitely worth reading. Uh, definitely take the time, click that link in the podcast description to read it. Uh, the two other points, uh, though, that he makes that I want to point out is you do need to get your timing down for casting a dry dropper rig. When you add an extra fly and, excuse me, when you add an extra fly and increase the length of your tippet when you put a dropper on to your dry fly, that means you're not going to throw as tight of a loop as you do with a single fly, all right? You've increased the length of your rig. Your loop needs to open up just a little bit more. You've got more line in the air, so you have to allow time for those loops to open on each casting stroke. As you cast further, that pause between casting strokes should increase, right? That's how we cast. We know that's what we're looking for. With a dry dropper, that pause should increase even more. You need to stop to let the line completely unroll before moving on to your next casting stroke. If you have to watch your fly line during the cast and nail the timing, do it. Nobody's going to make fun of you, and if they do, they're just jealous that you're catching fish, and they aren't. Okay? Uh, but really, getting the timing down, this is critical. Okay, This is important as finding me good wings when we go fishing together. If I don't have some good wings to eat after we're done fishing, I might be unhappy. Okay, depending on where we're at. That was one of my favorite things about my Niagara Falls trip a couple weeks ago, just by the way. The wings were phenomenal. Uh, anyways, force yourself to cast slower than you think you need to if you are getting a lot of tangles in your dry dropper rig. Slow it down. Okay, that's going to be some really good advice for you. Another thing that will help prevent those tangles is to limit how much you cast in the first place. False casting is largely unnecessary, right? Thank you, Brad Pitt, for making it look cool, but we don't really need to do it, and most of the best anglers I know do not cast that much, all right? So Brad Pitt doesn't know what the freak he's doing with his fly casting. 
And I'm referencing that movie, A River Runs Through It, and this is an unpopular opinion, but I hate that movie. I'll expand on that later. It's just, it bothers me. Anyways, uh, you don't need to false cast that much, all right? Uh, the more time that your dry dropper spends in the air, the more chances it has to get all tangled up and to get nasty. Focus instead on just getting your flies to the next spot in as few casts as possible. The best anglers, the best guides I know, are the ones who can pick their lineup and recast in a single motion. They catch way more fish than most of everybody else because their flies are on the water longer and they spend less time retying rigs after they've tangled. So hopefully that gives you some great advice on fishing dry dropper rigs. Thank you very much for that question. And would you look at that? We are already at the last question of the show. So last question, Craig from Utah. Craig, how are you doing, my friend? Good to hear from you. Uh, Craig, I just purchased a 10-foot three-weight Euro rod. Need to match a reel, hopefully one of the many I already own, and fly line to the rod. How do I match this properly to the rod to optimize for Euro nymphing? Please be very specific, especially with the fly line recommendation. Love the podcast. You're killing it. Craig, thanks a bunch. I appreciate the question. Hopefully, I'm specific enough. All right. And for those of you who have asked, uh, Euro Raw, Euro Collection, that stuff's all in the works here at Ventures. I'm not 100% sure when, but it's something that we are thinking through. We're trying to figure out the best. Uh, the best way to do it so that we give you guys the most value possible that that's kind of the guiding principle behind a lot of what we're doing is let's let's be deliberate about it and give it the best value that we possibly can so uh let's jump into craig's question here though all right uh start with matching a reel to the euro rod this is actually a really simple process thankfully what you're looking for is a good balance between the weight of your rod and the weight of your reel and line a 10-foot rod is on the shorter end for Euro rods. So you don't need a whole lot in the way of weight in your reel to make it balance effectively. Uh, I've got an 11-foot three-weight. I have some, I think I've got one that's like 11-foot three inches too. And I use much heavier reel to balance those out uh, than I do on my 10-foot Euro rods. So you don't need as heavy a reel as you would for like a you know, 10.5, 11-footer. But it still needs to be a little bit heavier. My rule of thumb uh, is any of the trout reels that you'd use with like a regular good old nine foot five weight, those should probably work great on your Euro rod to help balance it out. Uh, You want a heavier rod than you'd use on a normal three weight uh, for a reason that the folks over at Trout's Fly Fishing explain really well in an article about Euro reels. I've linked that in the podcast description as well. But the quote from their article says, another hallmark of a Euro nymphing setup is a moderately heavy fly reel that creates a well-balanced rod and reel combination allowing for the typical lift, lob, and repeat motion performed by the Euro-nymphing anglers. So hopefully that explains why you need that heavier reel. It's not just to balance the rod itself that's important, but it also anchors the casting motion of Euro-nymphing that's very different than our traditional fly casting, right? It, like, the, um, like the folks over at Trouts said, it's a lift, lob, and repeat motion. It's not your traditional casting motion. So you need a reel that will anchor that rod down so you can you can do that effectively and repeat it uh, efficiently. So again, any of the heavier reels on the market are going to be your best bet, like the Orvis Hydros. It's a great reel, just a little on the heavy side. Those would be fantastic. Uh, the Reddington Tilt, which is a Euro-specific reel, the Sage ESN, another Euro-specific reel, uh, and really any reel that's cast instead of machined. Cast reels are usually heavier than machined reels. So if you have any reels that are kicking around that are cast and you don't want to go get a brand new reel for your Euro rig, Craig, that would be an option. Uh, the Hardy UDLA reel is also another great option. The key to look, uh, the thing that you should be looking for with a Euro reel, though, in addition to the extra weight, is you want to get one that's full frame. What this means is that the reel spool sits entirely inside the reel frame itself. That makes it harder for your really thin Euro nymphing line and 
your very long leader to slip outside the spool and get tangled. Those full frame reels just make the whole process a lot smoother. So look for that. If you have one that's full frame, take advantage of it, use it, and you'll be very glad that you're rocking that full frame reel. Uh, as for the fly line itself, your old line is really thin and light. Uh, that helps you feel takes even when the line is out uh, the tip of your rod if you've got a really long Euro cast going on. So any of the Euro lines that are on the market right now, they're going to be really good options. Reddington and Scientific Anglers both make a Euro line that I've used and that I enjoy. I really like the SA Competition Nymph or the Rio FIPS Euro Nymph. Uh, they're both really good for setting up a brand new Euro rig and uh, they're cheaper than like your regular uh, trout fly line as well. So Craig, hopefully that helps you get set up. Hopefully you've got some stuff already kicking around that you can use. So you don't have to go out and buy another reel. Cause that'd just be a bummer. Wouldn't it I'd have to go buy more fly fishing gear? Who wants, who wants to buy more stuff, right? I mean, certainly. Certainly not me at all. I never want to buy new stuff. Uh, but that's the show today, folks. Uh, thank you very much for coming along on this little adventure with us, having fun. I'm enjoying the show, and hopefully you are as well. Uh, we'll keep doing these episodes as long as we keep getting questions from our audience. So if you have any questions that you would like answered, please click the link in the podcast description, submit your questions. That's what keeps this whole machine running, right? Your questions are the oil to our engine. If you want to have a weirdly, oddly uncomfortable metaphor there at the end, I apologize for that. But seriously, folks, thanks for listening. And keep those questions coming to us. We really appreciate them. And on behalf of everybody here at Ventures Flyco, until next week, tight lines.